Hello. Welcome Hello. Welcome to Rutgers. <laughs> nice to Thank see you, you Patrick. Um, by my recollection, this is either your third or fourth visit. I'm thinking if you come anymore, I'm going to have to give you adjunct status in the philosophy department. <laughs> well, got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> there, there goes the neighborhood. Believe me, we'd love to have you. You know, if you do a search on Wikipedia, you put a name in like John Smith, what pops up is usually all the, all the individuals named John Smith, but then it tells you you can identify the one you're looking for because it'll say John Smith entrepreneur, John Smith gadfly, John Smith martial arts expert, John Smith a philanthropist, and so on and so on. Uh, there's a weird thing about your name. If you, if you put your name in, one name pops up, and all those entries fall under it. How is it possible? Do you sleep? That was the first thing I thought when I looked you up. Well, Samuel Johnson <laughs> said when, you've, uh, when you tell a man is to be hung in a fortnight, it tends to focus his mind tremendously. <laughs> as you know, I was diagnosed with cancer as soon as I got out of college. I spent three years hospitalized. And so since then, everything, I've, who knows how long I'm going to be around, and while I'm here, I try to make the days count. Well, we hope it'll be a very long time. Sometimes uh, I'm not sure. Sometimes I'm like that Hollywood starlet who's saying, what do I have to do to get out of this movie? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. kidding. Um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that your father was a Rutgers alumnus. And I thought we might start off by you telling us a little bit about what you knew about Rutgers growing up and what your father shared with you about the university. He graduated in the, in the 50s, 51. right? 51. 51. 51. My, yes. And we, we grew up having, the Byrne family has had a long connection with Rutgers. Uh, my my father and uncle were born in Bridgeport as I'm sorry in Patterson St. Joseph Hospital is it still there I think so as was my granddad uh, about 1902 and the Byrne family grew up the Burns settled here from Ireland Ireland in a crescent from Long Island around through South Jersey or around through North Jersey the 1930s my granddad and moved the, the two boys, uh, my, my dad and my uncle, down to Wildwood. And so oh. they built families there, and I grew up always coming to Wildwood for the summers and such, for a time in the summers. And my father was the first kid from Wildwood High, so he claimed, to go to college. First burn, and absolutely went to college, and he came to Rutgers on Air Force ROTC, as did my uncle. And now we, we ended up moving to the Midwest and to New England, uh, but the, my cousins and, and the grand and, and the dis, dis, relatives near and far all come to Rutgers. There's right. a lot of burns here, and that's, the, that's when the connection started. But he couldn't have majored in business because they didn't have that at Rutgers when he was there. What did he study when he was he there? He majored in math. He was the, uh, I guess, something of a pretty stellar math student, he worked, and he worked he did a senior thesis under Joshua Barlez. He was very proud of this all his life. We always heard about Professor Barlez. And he was also the captain of the golf team. And then he, uh, uh, but so he did math here and yeah. started veering towards actuarial science, which led to a degree in insurance eventually. Well, he's uh, remembered well and he's honored every day with every Burns student. Every, uh, most of the freshmen at the, at the Rutgers University take Burns seminars. He would be so incredibly proud to know that. He passed three years ago, coming up in a month, and he would be incre incredibly proud, as is my mom today. They're very yeah. proud of the Burn. In fact, the Burn seminar program, they were, I think, influenced by that, uh, by a relationship I had as an undergraduate at Dartmouth with a friend of yours, Judy Lichtenberg, huh. and David Lubon. I had this very intimate relationship with them where they they... They started having me over for dinner sometimes, and my parents saw how much I got out of having a relationship with a couple professors on a, on a real, really not social, but a uh, much more intimate base. We were reading books and talking about specific books constantly and such, and it just did wonders for me, they felt, and their goal was to sort of create the conditions of that program for a, a much larger audience here at Rutgers. To fill in the history of you and Rutgers, one more name comes to mind, and that's the name Milton Freeman. I had assumed that you had met Milton Freeman through your father because they're both Rutgers alumni and they might have met at alumni events, but I, I guess that's not true. No. How did you get to know Milton Freeman? Did you know he was a Rutgers alumnus when you met him? I think <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if I knew the moment I met him, but I knew within a brief time, a short time thereafter, within a few minutes. 
because we started discuss. I met him through. Uh, I was involved with the Cato Institute, which is mm-hmm. a, a pro freedom th- think tank in Washington D.C. And the fellow there, uh, fellow there, said you should really get to know Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell. I read a lot of both of Friedman and Sowell. But the next chance I got, I went out and met Milton Friedman in his office, and uh, I mean, in his home, his apartment in San Francisco. Milton and Rose had me to tea, and thus began a, a nice, long, you know, about an eight year friendship. And did you ever bring your father and him together? My father, by then, was too ill. Uh-huh. Uh, he, he spent really the last t- decade of his yeah. life sort of slowly, slowly yeah. passing in, in New Hampshire was unable to travel. But uh, no, well, actually, and Milton, of course, what, well, it turns out Milton had grown up in, I think, Passaic, mm-hmm. uh, so not far from, from here, and had a very similar background. He had come to Rutgers. He was about 15 years older than my father. Yeah. Come to Rutgers, studied math, studied, I believe, actuarial science, or he was on his way to be an actuary, and he ended up getting diverted into economics. But he, uh, but I think he was a math student here, mm-hmm. and so we had lots of things to talk about. Rutger, we just turned out to have once we discovered we'd come from the old neighborhood, so to mm-hmm. speak, or my family and his did. We had a lot, that's mm-hmm. so much to talk about, and Rose too. I first met you when uh, there was a celebration of your father, and you came and gave a talk on education. And I'm wondering, is it a coincidence that the Rose and Milton Friedman Foundation is education-oriented and your own interests in education? Is there a connection there, or is it just happy coincidence? Uh, no, there's a deep connection. I decided in 1990, once I started making a few shekels in life, and I don't have a family of my own and sort of always suspect that I would not, that the goal of my life is to reform. It, I think there's two two propellers on the ship of civilization. They are how do you form human capital and how do you marry human capital to financial capital. You gotta do everything else right. You gotta defend the borders and have rule of law and stuff. But civilization is all about forming human capital and marrying it to financial capital, which means education and Wall Street. Those are the two systems I feel our country has to reform to survive. So to me, I always knew from the beginning that sort of the purpose of my life was education reform in the United States, and that's why this fellow at Cato eventually said to me, you should go see Milton Friedman, who of course started the, he and Rose started the Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation for school choice. And the idea is to give students a chance to pick their teachers. And that's the, uh, it, it, I mean, what we have at a college level, you have, we have the best university system in the world, it's the envy of the world, but at a K through 12 level, we have sort of a, and that's because at the university level, you get to choose where you go and the market responds and good things happen. K through 12 level, you're kind of allocated, it's the old Soviet model, and it's not working too well, I think. I know, it's always, it strikes me as extraordinary how well the universities do, given what's leading up to them, you know, the kind of education. I mean, if you're in a wealthy neighborhood, you're gonna get well educated, but some of these poor neighborhoods uh, one of the problems is, you know, I, I don't know if the, I'm completely accurate about this, but when the Zuckerman gift to uh, Newark was $100 million, something to that effect, I read somewhere that some huge chunk of that went through administration, you know, it didn't go into the classroom. Of course. And I know you have strong views about that. Right. There's really no way to, when a system is organized from the top down, it's very hard to, to reform it. Uh, I think when I see billionaires give away great gifts like that, it shows good intent. But I think that they're misunderstanding the nature of the problem. You know, there's a, there's about $850 billion going to educate 50 million kids in the United States per federal statistics. It's about uh, $17,000 per student. Uh, 24 kids per classroom. You're talking about four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand dollars of funding for the average classroom. Only the average teacher in America in K through 12 makes about 50, 51. With benefits, you might find 65. And of course, there's the cost of the space. Anyway, you can sort of see where about 80 or $90,000 worth of cost goes, but there's $430,000 worth of funds going into the system. It's not going to the teachers, I, well, I suspect. The, the teachers in New Jersey don't make 430,000. They're probably making, on average, 50, 60, something like that. It's all, there's huge layers of costs that they never get exposed to the public. 
And there's no way, I, in my view, to ever, you can sit at the top of a bureaucracy and holler down all you want and pound and implore and so forth. But at the end of the day, until you give the users a choice, a voucher, and say go where you want, you can't reform it. Just like at the college level, we do use vouchers. We call them GI bills and Pell Grants and stuff, but they're essentially vouchers. We don't say you, you can go to university, but you have to go to one in your zip code. We say go to any university you want, here's a voucher for it, the Pell Grant, the GI Bill. Uh, and so Milton's proposal in 1955 was we should apply the same system to the K through 12 and let uh, funding, kids withdraw, and take their funding where they to the school they want to go to, and only by doing that do, can the forces of competition sort of crack open this huge block of money that's going in that isn't actually reaching the teacher, mm -hmm. isn't reaching the classroom. You know, there was much more noise about vouchers five or six or so, no, actually more like ten years ago, I think. And now it looks like most of the energies are focused on charter schools. I mean, yes, it's charters or educational savings accounts. I'm not tied to vouchers as a, as a it's really all about giving choice. Anything mm -hmm. that gives choice to the parents is the step we want to go. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, World Stock? As well, World Stock. Did it have a different name originally? Was it called Artisan or something to that effect? No, it? no. It was always called World Stock, but the emphasis is Artisan Production, Overstock. So somewhere along the way, we built Overstock, and uh, <coughs> I figured out. I think considered the one inspired, maybe one of two inspired moments of my life, was when I realized that the Overstock platform would work really well with artisans as also. Mm -hmm. And we went around, I went around the world and hired people, and we set up what's now called fair trade. I'd never heard of fair trade. It just seemed like a good thing to do. I thought, well, we've got this whole great platform in Overstock. We'll find artisans. We'll sell their goods with no, uh, with no profit. And it's just to generate as much business for them. And there are about 50 countries and about 10,000 artisans. We focus on female artisans. And the idea was, let's just create employment for them. And it ended up making money. And we used the money to go build schools around the world, primarily for females. We have about seven or 8,000 kids, about 65% of them females, in schools from Indonesia to across Africa and mm -hmm. Afghanistan and mm -hmm. Nepal and such. This is an idea that popped in your head while you were tra traveling around on uh a motorcycle <laughs> in uh, Southeast Asia or something like that. Right. I have the, your, my fir <laughs> your first two years of starting a company like Overstock is you pretty much it's like 100-hour weeks, 120-hour weeks. After two years, I took a vacation, mm -hmm. uh, ended up on a motorcycle in Cambodia, which had not been the plan, and was going around and seeing artisan production. Do you know the, the full story on that? Are you? I, I broke I my arm. I know some of it. I know some of it. <laughs> I broke my arm in a motorcycle crash, and... Perhaps under some, I mean, I was really in, I was in the north of Cambodia, about 12 hours away from medical care, and somebody gave me some local painkiller. I had this broken arm, and I had some local painkiller, and sitting there in something of a stupor on a cot in the night, waiting for the dawn that I could start getting myself back. I, uh, on the effect of a local painkiller, never found out what that was. <laughs> but I suddenly had this idea. I could see that everything we had built for Overstock would work really well for these artisans I had been meeting. And Cambodia, there's a lot of people who have lost legs and arms and such for landmine survivors. I think it had, used to have the most landmine survivors in the world. They get retrained making as artisans. And so I was seeing all these great production, wondering why it doesn't ever, you don't see it in the U U.S. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that the system we had built could handle it just, mm -hmm. just fine. It, it doesn't work for mass retail, but it would work perfectly for a company that was already set up to handle mm -hmm. dribs and drabs and small amounts of things. One of the things I was thinking about when I was reading your profile again, most of which I knew already, but it struck me. So as you know, um, as funding decreases for education, uh, humanities suffers more and more because they don't have an NIH or NSF or uh, patents and things of that sort. And uh, we produce some high quality PhDs in humanities, in philosophy in particular, that I know about, and there just aren't any jobs. I mean, I was shocked this year how few jobs there were available for students coming out. So much so that we advertised a postdoc, not even a full time position, just a postdoc, and we had almost 400 applications mm. for one postdoc. And I was thinking that. One of the questions that I was uh, 
being raised over and over again is what are the non-academic opportunities for philosophers, for example. And I think you're probably an expert on this. <laughs> well, I think there <laughs> what are. What would you say to me? <laughs> I think they're enormous. I think they're enormous. I think philosophy, the humanities in general, don't listen to people who, you know, you, you don't have to go to college and and be acquiring a certain skill. We look all the time. I, I consider it a, a mana from heaven when someone walks through the door with a philosophy degree or a history degree or an English degree because it means, A, they can read critically and express themselves well in writing. Well, you know, those are two, two big skills that a lot of folks don't get anymore, certainly coming out of, uh, out of uh, you know, uh, well, kind of when they graduate high school. Uh, they can, so philosophy gives you, in my mind, philosophy is a chance to, it's like getting to spend all of your life in, or, or years of your life in either a gym or let's say a gymnastic studio where you're exercising every muscle perfectly, getting perfectly conditioned. Now you can go and spend your life being a gymnastics coach, af coach mm -hmm. after that, or you can go and do lots of other things with it, but you've, you've conditioned your mental physique to be mm -hmm. super well-rounded and capable. So it's, it's part of it is just the communication skills. A lot of it is thinking critically, being able to think, think about complex things and come up with solutions. I think about problems we've had within Overstock that we struggled for years on. And I would have, no offense to any other majors, but I'd have <laughs> computer scientists working on something they wouldn't get an answer or, or various technologists wouldn't get an answer. And in this one particular case, I'd put a philosophy, I have a philosophy undergrad who'd come to us, put him on it. And sure enough, he, within about three months, had figured out the right approach. And mm -hmm. then, it, then you need the technologist to write the Java code mm -hmm. and such. But the... He was able to think deep, deeply about something because, I think, of his career in philosophy. Did you ever think, uh, when you think about yourself and your own career, uh, was there a time when you thought, well, I guess I'm going to leave philosophy and I'm going to try something new? Or did you always know philosophy was with you? I mean, has it, has it been salient for you in your, I, in your career that your, your philosophical training was with you every day? Oh, it absolutely was with me every day. Everybody knows me, perhaps in business as being a bit eccentric, but which they, the, those who work f with me, my colleagues, understand it as having come from uh, philosophy. I never in, actually intended to be a philosopher. Mm -hmm. I, int I mean, I, I had since, since I was probably 10, I knew what I was going to study in college. I knew it was going to be philosophy. It wasn't sure if I would do graduate work or not, but my plan was always, was never, I, I was actually honestly curious about these deeper issues in life and I mm -hmm. wanted to think about them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did it. Something, it, it wasn't sort of, I hadn't made it my career path. I was, I was open to it. Uh, but around the time I finished my PhD, I, I was also doing, as a teenager, I was also doing small entrepreneurial gigs. Mm -hmm. And I had, by the time I was in my late 20s, I had led a group of friends and family to invest in a small company in New Hampshire, a small industrial torch production company. And I'd been doing lots, about 20 deals along the way, small deals from crisp, tr Christmas tree lots and things mm -hmm. like that to other small real estate things. And I ended up I ended up leading a group of 30 or 40 friends and family from college to invest in a small uh, plant in New Hampshire, and then it ran into some trouble, and I stepped in. I left academia. Just as I was about to wrap up my PhD, I left for what I thought was about six months to go run this little manufacturing plant, and then... Ever since then, it's been yeah. Al Pacino and Godfather 3. <laughs> Every time I get started to get this. They pull you back in. They pull you back in. Um, so, you know, most disciplines, for example, philosophy, we have national meetings where philosophers get together and discuss topics. Is there any counterpart to that for CEOs? Is there a national, international group <laughs> where you get to show off your wax philosophical in front of these other CEOs? Or is that, that, that doesn't happen very often. No, well, not about the waxing philosophically. There are a number of such groups. I'm, I'm at the end of the week. So I'm leaving here tonight. Uh, I'm leaving here tonight 
just to give you my schedule, I'm yeah. flying to Paris for a day of meetings, <laughs> London for a day of meetings, Belgium on Thursday for a day of meetings, have to be in Miami Friday night, and I'm spending the weekend with a group of folks from Silicon Valley, uh, those kinds of billionaire types who all want to sort of get the update on a new era of technology. So that's my, so yes, they do get together, but usually the conferences are not focused on yeah. philosophy or yeah, something. They're yeah. focused on, okay, here's this new technology. Let's all get together yeah. and learn about it. Yeah. It's like the typical life of a philosopher, it sounds like. Now, um, I'm assuming you're partly your philosophical training uh, brought about you being the most hated man on Wall Street because of your <laughs> high moral standards and so on. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Are, are, you, are you safe yet? <laughs> well, I'm safe because I think that they would cause themselves more trouble if they blew me up, and that was kind of the strategy all along. I think I came here once and I had to Rutgers, and I asked them to, I was giving a talk at the philosophy department, I asked them to turn off the video, and I played some, some recordings I of the death I remember that very clearly, <laughs> very clearly. Uh, yes, we went public in 02, and when you're a public company CEO, you're out there in the mix, as the kids say today. You're out there with prime brokers and regulators and hedge funds, and you're sort of mingling around from Greenwich to, uh, anyway, you're just mingling around. And it didn't take, probably by 04, I rely, I smelled skunk. I smelled skunk. And there's a dozen different ways I smelled skunk and how. And I just started swimming around in it and mapping it all out. Mm -hmm. And then I started going very public. And in 05, I started accusing Wall Street of being deeply corrupt. I said that there is real systemic risk building up and that the government at the time seemed to be asleep at the switch. And if not actually under the thumb of Wall Street. All of which in 05, when you came out and said, well, said things like, Washington seems to be under the thumb of Wall Street and they're actually kind of all bought off and these regulators, these these hedge funds have senators on speed dial and regulators and can sort of order and game the system. That also, like the, Wash, uh, the New York Post used to run photos of me with UFOs coming out of my head because <laughs> I was saying things like, Wall Street is, has Washington under its thumb. That's like some big conspiracy yeah, theory yeah. they used to say. Yeah, yeah. So. But it drives um, some of the uh, direction that you're moving in entrepreneurially as well. So the, I assume the Bitcoin uh, is in some sense the practical answer to a deeply philosophical problem uh, it, it, or moral problem. You've done your homework. I mean, you, you're, <laughs> you're exactly right. Yeah, well, I couldn't really back out of the fight because it's, I, th I was like a dog with a bone and I didn't realize or I was like that proverbial dog who caught the truck. And I didn't quite know what to do with it. I didn't. I thought I was taking on a couple crooks. I didn't know that the thing was going to lead to what it did lead to. And eventually, everybody, the whole network of people I was talking about, were the people who got indict indictments for insider trading and paid mm -hmm. billion dollar mm -hmm. fines and that kind of stuff. There's a solution, and that is, and I hope Rutgers is getting a program together in this because I think that this is an innovation of world historic consequences. And that is something called the blockchain. And the blockchain is the technology that underlies Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the main event of Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the footnote. The main event is that the technology that's underlying Bitcoin, the blockchain, is going to be used towards all, for all kinds of other things than money. So for example, you can create a version of Wall Street that runs on the blockchain that no one can cheat. Imagine that, a version of Wall Street mm -hmm. where all kinds of the mischief that you read about in Wall Street can't be done. A version of Wall Street that would actually be square and tidy and correct. Uh, it's going to be for many, so that's, uh, that's what I got involved in about two years ago. Have been very aggressive about it and about six months ago Wall Street woke up and got the joke. There's a, a the biggest bank, fourth biggest bank in the world, Paribas in France, came out this summer and said, this invention is bigger than the steam engine and internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. JP Morgan has said, this technology is going to come and eat Wall Street's lunch. What's going to happen in the fi next five years to Wall Street is like something I think we've never, you'll never see in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's an extinction event for many companies on Wall Street. Many of those companies that those 
uh, it's kind of ironic. I was a one-man Occupy Wall Street starting mm -hmm. in 04, 05. Mm -hmm. There was a group of companies that I share the Occupy Wall Street's attitude towards, a bunch of intermediaries, and there's a significant fraction of them that are going to see, I think, an extinction event. And, and, well, they, and they, well, they actually see the extinction event coming down the road. Everybody's scrambling to get ahead of it. The last six months has been, I've never seen a, in my life a kind of land rush in business and a freak out, just an open freak out among these companies. Because suddenly you've got these $100 billion companies and trillion dollar banks realizing they're facing an extinction event. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Okay. Uh, well, you're going to talk more about that this afternoon, I hope. I am. And uh, you're going to be doing it here at Rutgers. And I, I feel like you're this part of your family now, or you're part of our family. I'm not sure whose family we are, but we're one family together. I like to and, feel that and way. I'm looking forward to your lecture today. I'm looking forward to you coming back over and over and over again. Sir, it's a real honor. And any time I get invited to Rutgers, it's a real honor. My father's been taking us here since we were, I was three or four years old. I grew up singing on the banks of the old <laughs> Raritan. And it's a, tr it's a special honor when I get a chance to come to Rutgers. All right, it's great having you here today. Thanks, Thank sir. you.